What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video, we're gonna be talking about the structure and function of bacteria. Before we get started, if you guys like this video, you benefit from it, please hit that like button, comment down in the comment section, and please subscribe. Also, if you want some awesome illustrations and notes to follow along with this video, check that down in the description box below. All right, Ninja Nerds, let's get into it. All right, Ninja Nerds, so when we talk about the structure and function of bacteria, we should have a basic understanding of just a little bit about the structure. So if we take this nice, beautiful, little diagram here uh, of a bacteria, we should kind of point out some of the different components of it. We're going to go into a little bit more detail on those structures, a little bit more about what they're made up of, what they do, what's the significance of it. But let's just have a basic idea of the basic anatomy or structure of this bacteria. So first thing is let's talk about some of the things that are coming off of the bacteria, which we're going to refer to as appendages. Some of these things that you guys want to know is, first one is this big old orange thing that's popping out off this thing. What is this structure here called? Do you guys know? This is called the flagella. Okay, so this structure right here is called your flagella. And obviously we'll talk about what that does and what it's made up of in just a second. These little brown things, the tiny little brown things that are coming off of this actual bacteria here, these little guys here, are called your fimbrae. And then this big one here, this longer one, which there's less frequent of, is called your pilus, okay? So these are some of the big appendages that I want you guys to remember. Big orange thing, flagella, little guys with numerous amounts of them is fimbrae, and this long one, which is usually less frequent, a little bit longer, is your pilus, okay? Now, the next thing that I want you guys to know, we're not gonna actually have it visualized inside of this bacteria, but some bacteria we'll talk about in a second can have these structures inside of them called endospores. We'll talk about that a little bit later though. All right, the next thing is basically the actual kind of like cell envelope, okay? This bacteria has this big, thick kind of like blue wall around it. And that big, thick blue wall that we're gonna discuss in pretty good detail later is made up of multiple different components, and that's called the cell envelope. And again, we'll kind of dig into that, talk about the multiple layers of the cell envelope, what they're made up of, what's their function. Okay, so, so far we have the appendages. We'll talk about a specialized structure called the endospore, which just isn't pictured here. Then we have the covering around the actual bacteria, which is this big, thick kind of blue wall called the cell envelope, made up of multiple different layers. Inside of the bacteria, though, you'll actually notice a couple different things. You have all these like little, blue, uh, sorry, not blue, <laughs> red dots. These red dots are all of your ribosomes. So you have a bunch of different ribosomes, baby little ribosomes present inside of the actual bacteria. And then you have a big kind of purple entanglement of DNA. This right here is actually called the bacterial chromosome, okay? So this is your bacterial chromosome, okay? So we're just gonna call this the bacterial chromosome. And then this little guy right here is another piece of DNA actually present in the bacteria, but it's not a part of the bacterial chromosome and only actually some bacteria have this. Um, and it's a little circular, small piece of DNA. And this is called your plasmid. And again, we'll discuss this a little bit later as well. But these are some of like the basic things that I want you guys to know about the actual bacterial structure. Again, real quick recap, appendages, you have the flagella, which is this orange structure, little guys coming off are the fimbrae, the long ones, which are usually less a uh, number of them, is the pilus. You have this big blue kind of structure surrounding it called the cell envelope made up of multiple layers, which we'll discuss in detail. And then inside you have these little baby ribosomes, some bacterial chromosome, which is in this kind of area. You know, in uh, uh, eukaryotic cells, we have a, a nucleus that actually surrounds the DNA, the, the actual chromosome of within eukaryotic cells. And bacteria, they don't have a nucleus. So this bacterial chromosome or DNA that we have here usually sits in this area of the actual bacteria cytoplasm, so we call it the nucleoid, so it's kind of like a nucleus. So again, remember, there is no defined nucleus in a bacterial cell. It sits in what's called a nucleoid type of area. And then you have this small little circular DNA in the bacteria, some bacteria called a plasmid. Okay, beautiful. Let's actually dig in though to these different things and talk about them a little bit more. The first one we'll talk about is the appendages, the things that are hanging off of the bacteria. The first one is the flagella. Now, the flagella, I just want you to know the basic concept. What is the purpose of the flagella? 
And really, it's like motility. So the primary function of the flagella is for motility. It basically allows for the bacteria to be able to move around in different areas. It might create kind of like a little corkscrew type of action. Now, how does it do that? Well, it's powered by ATP, so you need ATP in order to power the flagella to be able to beat. But when we look at the structure of the flagella, you have a couple different components that you may be asked to annotate, maybe on an exam of some form. But there's multiple different rings. You see this blue component here? This blue component is actually called the basal body. Now the basal body is the part that has different types of protein rings that are kind of situated within the actual cell envelope. So this component here is actually called the basal body. Okay, that's what's kind of situated within the cell envelope. The purple component here is called the hook of the flagella. So this purple part here is called the hook of the flagella. And then the last part is the filamentous portion here, which is all of this portion here. This is called the filament of the actual flagella. So if you're asked to annotate the actual flagella, this will be kind of the basic annotation of it, okay? So you know the flagella is for motility. We know the basic kind of like structural annotation of the flagella. Now the next thing that you need to know about the flagella is also that some bacteria have different kind of like configurations of the flagella around their actual like their self. So if you look here, you can notice that this, these bacteria here, their flagella may be all over the place. They might be situated on one side, they may be situated on both sides. There's particular names that you have to know for these organisms that have these weird funky flagella configurations. So let's talk about those. Whenever you have a actual flagella that's located on one pole of the bacteria, we call this monotrichus. So monotrichus it would be uh, kind of an example of something like Vibrio, okay? This would be an example of like Vibrio uh, cholera, okay? The next thing is if you have multiple flagella coming from one polar end of a bacteria, we call this Lophotrichus, okay? The next thing is, if you, and again, Lophotrichus could be kind of an example of potentially something like a, like a Pseudomonas species. So sometimes a Pseudomonas species may be Lophotrichus. The next thing is if you have flagella on both ends, the polar ends of the bacteria, we call this Amphitrichus. And this last one here, we can have flagella kind of extended all around the entire surface area of the bacteria. Uh, this is called peritrichus. And this would be a good example of like E. coli. Okay, so we have an understanding, a very basic understanding of what I need you guys to know of the flagella. It's designed for motility, the basic structure that has the basal body, you have the hook, you have the filament, it's powered by ATP so it needs energy to be able to beat and move the bacteria from place to place. You also should understand the different configurations of the actual flagella on bacteria. Monotrichus, one flagella on one end, lophotrichus, multiple flagella on one polar end, amphitrichus, you have flagella on both ends, and peritrichus throughout the the entire surface area of the bacteria. Beautiful, boom, roasted. Let's move on to the next part of the appendages. This is the fembrae versus the pilus. I kind of already alluded to this a little bit. Here's the big thing. Sometimes in textbooks, it's referred to as sometimes synonymous. It's kind of the same thing. But some of the more modern literature is actually saying that it's not really actually the same thing. There is some definable differences between the fembrae and the pilus. Now, what are some of those differences? One of the big things to think about when we talk about the fembrae and the pilus is that the fembrae are actually shorter, okay? So the first thing that I want you to remember is that they are actually shorter and they're thinner in comparison to the pilus. Okay, so that's one thing. Shorter and thinner. The next thing that I want you guys to remember about this is that there is a larger number of fembrae spread along the bacterial surface area in comparison to the pilus. Another thing, you know, 
the pilus that you actually form, it actually comes from a very specific kind of, I'm sorry, the fembrae that you form that is actually formed from a very particular structure within the bacteria. Remember we were talking about the two different types of DNA? There was the bacterial chromosome and then there was the plasmid. They're both DNA. The actual fembrae is formed from the bacterial chromosome. So that's what I want you to remember. The actual bacterial chromosome will have particular genes that will be transcribed, translated, and make proteins that are involved in making these actual fembrae. So that's important. Now, we have a basic understanding here. Fembrae, there's more of them. They're shorter, they're thinner, and they're formed from the actual genes from bacterial chromosomes. What do they do? What's the whole purpose of these suckers? The whole purpose of them is they allow for attachment or adherence to different types of cell surfaces. So they're going to allow for attachment or adherence to cell surfaces. Okay, beautiful. Now let's compare that to the pilus. The pilus is actually, again, now we have a basic understanding we can just compare here based on this. So if this had a large number, what do you think a pilus has? Yeah, less number. I know you guys said it, right? So there's a lower number of pili within this actual bacteria. Um, the other thing is if you look at them, they're obviously not shorter, they're longer, and they're a little bit thicker. Okay. Here's another thing to add on. When you actually look at the pilus, if we were to actually kind of look at that, the pilus actually comes from a part of the bacteria. So let's say that we kind of draw the same kind of bacterial structure that we have over here. The pilus actually comes from a different DNA portion of the actual bacteria. So the fembrae came from the bacterial chromosome. Where do you think the pilus is actually coming from? It's coming from the plasmid. So the plasmid is the structure that has DNA that whenever those genes are transcribed, translated, it'll then be translated into make proteins that are involved in forming the pilus. Okay, so that's important to remember. So some of the big differences between fembrae and pilus is that fembrae, you have more number, they're shorter, they're thinner. Pilus, there's a decreased number of them, they're longer, they're thicker. The fembrae, the actual structure, the proteins from it are made from bacterial chromosome. Pilus, the proteins are made from the plasmid. The other thing that's important to know about this is what is the basic function of the actual fem, I'm sorry, the pilus. What is the big, big function of this? The big function of the pilus is it plays a role in a process called uh, bacterial conjugation. And we'll briefly discuss this in just a second. But before I do that, there's one more thing that helps us to differentiate uh, fembrae from pilus. With fembrae, you can see these generally in both gram positive and negative bacteria. And we'll talk about what the heck that means a little bit later. Whereas in someone who has pili, pili are a little bit more particularly seen in gram negative bacteria, not so much in gram positive bacteria. Okay? All right, so the basic understanding of the differences in their structure, the differences in how they're made, function for fembrae as attachment of cell surfaces, the, pli uh, the pilus is for bacterial conjugation. So let's briefly talk about what the heck bacterial conjugation is. Bacterial conjugation is a really cool process and it's a way by which bacteria can become resistant to certain types of drugs, particularly like antibiotics, and I'll explain in a second. So very, very briefly, let's say here we have a bacteria, okay? And this bacteria has a plasmid, okay? Now this plasmid may have genes on it that uh, it can get transcribed, translated, and make particular proteins or enzymes that can break down antibiotics and make those antibiotics less effective against that bacteria. But since this bacteria maybe has that plasmid that allows for it to be able to make a particular pilus, we call this plasmid that's in this bacteria that's gonna help to make this pilus an F positive bacteria. It means it's just a fertility positive. Now, what happens is this plasmid will do a couple things. It may transcribe, get translated, make proteins, and then initiate the formation of a pilus. Okay, so let's say here we have a pilus. 
The other thing that it may do is not only help to make a pilus, but also replicate and make another plasmid. Why? Because the goal is to be able to pass that plasmid onto another bacteria through the pilus. The pilus is kind of like a little tunnel from bacteria to bacteria where you can pass genetic material from one to another. So we'll see how that's done. So again, we have this bacteria. It's fertility positive, F positive, meaning it has the plasma that can make a particular protein or an enzyme that's important maybe in antibiotic resistance. It'll make the pilus, it'll then replicate that plasmid. Now, now that it's done that, let's actually see what this would look like. So here's this plasmid, the extra replicated version, and then we're gonna draw the pilus. Now the pilus is going to attach from one bacteria to another, kind of like a little tunnel or channel. Now that that pilus is connected from this bacteria, what is this bacteria called again? Since it has the plasmid, we call this the F positive or the fertility positive. This one, does it have a plasmid present? No. So we call this F negative, or there's no fertility factor there, there's no plasmid present, but it's gonna have it soon. What happens is this plasmid helped to make the pilus, it also replicated, and so now that I have this pilus, I can pass this actual plasmid that we just replicated onto this other bacteria that's F negative. And then what's the result? The result of this is that both of these bacteria are now F positive. What's the whole goal of this? Like just why, why the heck do I need to know this? Let's say, just for an example, this plasmid has a very particular protein that it's actually expressing. Maybe the plasmid is expressing a very particular type of enzyme. And to give you an example of this, let's say that this enzyme is called beta-lactamase. Beta-lactamase, you know what it does? It breaks down the beta-lactam ring in penicillin. So it basically renders, inhibits penicillin uh, from its having its effect. And penicillin is basically an antibiotic that's trying to prevent bacterial growth. This bacteria may have this plasmid to make an enzyme like beta-lactamase to break down penicillin and make it resistant to the penicillin. But this bacteria over here that was fertility negative, it may have not had that actual plasmid to make that enzyme to make it what? resistant to the penicillin. So this bacteria says, hey, let me help you be resistant to penicillin. I'll pass you on some of the genetic material that you need to make that beta-lactamase so that if penicillin comes near you, you can break it down. And so this is how bacteria can become resistant by passing on that genetic material through these dang piluses, okay? All right, so we have a basic understanding of that beautiful. So we now know flagella, we understand fembrate, we understand pili. The next thing that we talked about very briefly that we didn't say we had a structure to show you is called an endospore. Endospores are basically specialized structures that are only found in certain types of bacteria. Okay, there's a, you know, there's a bunch of them, but the big ones that I want you guys to know about the endospores is they're, they're found in very particular type of bacteria. I'm just gonna say the Clostridium species. And there's different types of Clostridium species. Clostridium tetani, right, the tetanus. Uh, Clostridium perfringens. Uh, there's, uh, uh, again, there's also Clostridium difficile, or C. diff. So those types of bacteria have the ability to produce something called endospores. Another one is called um, a Bacillus anthracis. So these bacteria have the ability to produce these really nasty things called endospores. Now, what the heck are these endospores? Why are they produced? Why are they so nasty? And why are they, you know, what's the significance of them within these particular bacteria? So endospores basically are going to allow for bacteria to be resistant to very harsh environments. So what, what, what do I mean? Let's write this down so that you guys know exactly like what, I, what I'm trying to tell you here. So the whole purpose, the function, is it allows for the bacteria to be resistant to high temperature. So if there's really high temperatures, the endospore will help the bacteria to be able to thrive in high temperatures. It may be able to thrive in like where there's lots of UV radiation maybe in environments where there's less 
nutrients, or lots of chemicals or maybe even a really dry environment, okay? So basically the function of the endospore is to be able to still survive and become resistant to very harsh environments like high temperature, lots of UV radiation, lower nutrients, maybe kind of a dry environment, chemicals like antibiotics, things of that nature. So how does it do that is the question. So again, we know what type of bacteria this would form in. We know the whole purpose of them is to function, to become resistant in particular types of harsh environments. Now, how does it do that? But what happens here is you have this actual bacteria, like the Clostridium or the Bacillus anthracis, and it has this actual kind of like vegetative cell, we call it. Inside of that vegetative cell, you have your bacterial chromosome, right? Which is basically the DNA that's designed to be able to make enzymes and proteins that allow for the bacterial cell to function. When it's exposed to these harsh environments, high temperature, lots of UV radiation, certain types of chemicals or lo lower nutrient you know, uh, availability. We need it to be able to you know, accommodate and acclimate to that. So what does it do? First thing it does is it undergoes kind of replication process. So we take that actual bacterial chromosome and we replicate it. And so now we have two of these DNAs, right? So we have some daughter DNA. Then what we're gonna do is, is we're gonna try to have this actual replicated DNA kind of start like separating from one another and have them go to one end pole, okay? So we're gonna have one of this actual daughter DNA kind of congregate towards this end pole and have that mother bacterial DNA kind of congregate to the other end pole. Once it does that and we kind of get them towards the end poles, a cell membrane kind of partition or septa will form between the mother DNA and this kind of daughter DNA. Okay, so now we form like a septa. And technically this end here where we have that daughter DNA, we call that the four spore, all right? Then what happens is something very interesting happens. The actual membrane that's surrounding this mother DNA wants to actually come around and kind of in, engulf or invaginate around the DNA, the daughter DNA within the four spore. And so it does that, it actually kind of engulfs it. And when it does that, it forms like a double layered membrane around it. So this actual kind of like mother cell component with the mother DNA will kind of engulf and invaginate and wrap around that actual four spore portion and form a double layered membrane around that actual daughter DNA. Then what happens is the mother DNA starts to degrade by particular types of enzymes that'll get broken down, okay? Then what happens? Now, after we've formed that double layered membrane, we actually wanna put some particular types of sugar and um, protein content in between it. And so then what happens is you put what's called a peptidoglycan layer between that double layered membrane. Okay, so now we have a peptidoglycan layer there between the double layered membrane that's wrapped around the daughter DNA that got invaginated by the actual, or engulfed I should say, by the mother cell component where the mother DNA was, and that got broken down. Then what happens is we actually take and have calcium kind of rush in to this endospore component. So again, it's gonna have the peptidoglycan component in between that double layered membrane where their daughter DNA is and there's gonna be production of enzymes and proteins in that component of the endospore. But what's gonna happen now is we're gonna have calcium kind of like rushing in. We're gonna have calcium rushing in to this actual endospore. Now when calcium rushes in, water starts leaking out kind of making it a little bit more of a drier environment in that area. Then, after calcium rushes into the endospore, we kind of pull water out of it. What's the last thing that kind of happens here? Well, let's kind of, again, recap here. We have our double layered membrane. Our double layered membrane contains within it what? Peptidoglycan layer. The peptidoglycan layer. Then what happens? You have calcium that rushes into the endospore, which draws out water, kind of drying out the endospore a little bit. And then the last thing to happen is you wanna put one more coating around this actual endospore that makes it, again, more resistant to harsher environments. And so you put this kind of what's called a keratin coating, this is called keratin coating, around that actual spore. And then lytic enzymes will actually break down the actual vegetative cell, 
and release out that endospore that now can survive and thrive within these harsh environments because what does it have within it? It has the DNA that can make proteins and enzymes that allows for it to be able to function and then it has a peptidoglycan layer, it has a dried out environment, it has a keratin coating, everything that it needs to be able to really be able to re be resistant um, in these all of these tough harsh environments which is pretty cool. Okay, so that's something to think about. Okay, we done nailed the appendages, the specialized structures. Now let's go ahead and hit that cell envelope and the different components and functions there. All right, the next components, so we covered the appendages, we covered the specialized structure of the endospore. We know their structure, we know their function, we know the differences. The next part is the cell envelope, and this is really probably one of the more, more important parts of this lecture is the cell envelope. Now the cell envelope, I told you, it was this big, thick blue covering that we saw in this structure here, but in reality, it's multiple different layers within that. So what I want us to do is actually go through the layers of the cell envelope from the most outer part all the way to the most inner part. Systematically going through what is it made up of, what does it do, what's the significance of it. So the first one, which is the most outer component of the cell envelope is actually called, there's two components, it's actually the capsule or the slime layer. They're relatively, we kind of can put them in a category of what we call like the glycocalyx, but Let's kind of have a basic understanding of what the difference is between these two are, what's the significance of them. The first one let's talk about is the capsule. The capsule is actually made up of, you see this green structure here? It's actually made up of polysaccharides, right? But the polysaccharide layer here is really organized. So what I want you to remember is a very organized polysaccharide coating that makes up that capsule when it's uh, there, okay? So again, organized polysaccharide network that is present within the capsule. When you compare that to the slime layer, the polysaccharide layering or network that's present here is a little bit more loose. So let's actually kind of utilize those as kind of easy terms to help us to differentiate between capsule and slime layer. It's a polysaccharide network organized in the capsule, looser, kind of a little bit more laxed when it comes to the slime layer. Okay, that's the basic concept. What is the actual significance of the capsule and what is the significance or function of the slime layer? The significance of the capsule is it actually acts as what's called a virulence factor. So it acts as what's called a virulence factor. You're like, what the, what that mean, man? I got you, dog. The virulence factor is, is it's basically the ability to promote infection, okay? So it has the ability to evade the immune system. Now, how would it do that? What happens is the bacterial capsule makes it more difficult for certain types of white blood cells to phagocytose that bacteria. So it actually decreases the phagocytosis kind of like efficacy, if you will, um, by white blood cells like macrophages and neutrophils. And so it makes it harder for those white blood cells to be able to kind of latch on, grab the bacteria and pull it in, okay? So that's one of the interesting thing about the capsules. What I really, really want you to know when it comes to significance in clinical medicine is that these capsules on bacteria can make them a little bit more nasty and cause them pretty nasty infections in certain populations. And that's why we actually try to develop vaccines for some of these encapsulated bacteria that you guys should be getting. You know what's the big ones that I want you to remember that we have vaccines for is what's called streptococcus pneumonia, haemophilus influenza, uh, particularly type B, and then what's called Neisseria, meningitis, okay? These are the three types of bacteria that have a capsule around them that we actually have vaccines for and are very important. You know why these are very important? Because you know certain people who have like, what, don't have a spleen or they get their spleen removed for some particular reason, maybe sickle cell anemia or uh, you know, hereditary spherocytosis of some kind. If they don't have a spleen, they're more susceptible to infections by encapsulated bacteria because the spleen's really good at removing those types of bacteria. So again, remember these bacteria that have capsules they're a little bit easier to evade the immune system by reducing that phagocytosis efficacy, but we have vaccines to try to reduce that process. There's other bacteria that have capsules that, you know, like, you know, Pseudomonas, E. coli, Klebsiella, Salmonella. But again, these are the big three that I want you to remember because these are the ones that we try to have vaccines for.
Okay, good, slime layer. We know it's a loose polysaccharide network. What the heck is the significance of it? The slime layer, basically its function is to allow adherence to cell surface. Okay, so it may be able to kind of like latch on to different types of cell surfaces within a host cell. But what's even more interesting is it may be able to adhere to foreign substances. Foreign, yeah, foreign substances or certain types of molecules. So let, let me give you an example of that. Um, you know whenever somebody gets intubated and they put an endotracheal tube in and maybe it sits in there for a while because they have to remain intubated, that endotracheal tube is a foreign substance. In certain types of bacteria, you know Pseudomonas is a very classic example of this one. So Pseudomonas is a very classical example of a bacteria that loves to form slime layers. If someone has like an endotracheal tube, sometimes the Pseudomonas bacteria can actually adhere to the endotracheal tube and form kind of a biofilm around it and increase the risk of you know, ventilator associated pneumonias. If you have a catheter that's placed into a vein, like a central venous catheter, okay, a central venous catheter, there's also a risk of bacteria kind of clinging onto that foreign catheter substance and leading to slime layers and biofilms forming on that. And then lastly, if there's kind of like a Foley catheter, or urethral catheter. Again, that's a foreign substance that certain types of bacteria like Pseudomonas may cling to and form biofilms around. So that's kind of the big thing to remember when it comes to the actual slime layer. Now, we covered that aspect, and we have the capsule, we have the slime layer, we know their differences in structure, we know their function, we know the significance of them. Let's move on to the next aspect and the next inner part of the cell envelope, which is the outer membrane. All right, so we covered the capsule, we covered the slime layer. Let's go to the next inner layer, which is the outer membrane. Now, outer membrane, what is it made up of? It's basically a phospholipid bilayer, but it has a very, very specific type of structure and components within it, which we'll annotate here in just a second. What I do want you to really, really, really don't forget, the outer membrane is only present in a particular type of uh, bacteria. It is only and gram-negative bacteria. Please don't forget that, okay? Outer membrane only present in gram-negative bacteria. It's a phospholipid bilayer. Now, let's talk about what is in that phospholipid bilayer that makes it so significant. So we're gonna take a gram-negative bacteria, parts of that actual um, outer membrane, and zoom in on it. When we do that, we get this structure. So obviously you can see your phospholipid bilayer here. You can see the, uh, you know, the glycerol head, and you can see the, well, the phospholipids, and then you can see the fatty acid tails here. Some of the actual structures that are present in this outer membrane, you have like porins, right? So these are basically just kind of like little proteins that allow for the transport of certain types of drugs or substrates or certain types of molecules to be able to transport in and out of the bacterial cell. Simple, right? But what's really important is that there is a endotoxin. Write that down. This is a endotoxin toxin that is present within this outer membrane. And we are, we're gonna abbreviate this, we call this lipopolysaccharides. Lipopolysaccharides, LPS. The lipopolysaccharide is an endotoxin, we'll talk about the significance of a second, but we have to know what are the three components of the lipopolysaccharide and which component of that lipopolysaccharide is actually the scary negative one. Three parts of it, you have this red part. This red part here is called lipid, a, okay, and this is the nasty one, and we'll talk about what it, why it's nasty in a second. The next one is the pink part. So we call this, we're gonna call this the core polysaccharide, okay? So basically like a, 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 a polymer of sugar molecules. And then this blue component, which is extending out here, okay? This component here that's extending out is called the O antigen, okay? It's called the O antigen. These three components make up the endotoxin, the lipopolysaccharide. Now, why is this significant? The lipid A is actually the one that can activate or stimulate particular types of white blood cells. You know like macrophages? It can stimulate macrophages to release particular types of cytokines like interleukin-1, 
interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha, and basically what these things can do is they can cause tons and tons and tons of problems. They basically can potentially stimulate kind of a septic process because they can cause fevers, they can cause a massive inflammatory reaction, they can cause blood clots that lead to DIC, they can cause damage to the endothelium, they can cause vasodilation and hypotension, tons and tons of problems. The core polysaccharide, nothing particular to know about that, but the O antigen, whenever our immune system becomes activated, they get exposed to this bacteria and they start to basically amount an immune response and produce antibodies. You know where the antibodies love to attack? They love to attack that O antigen. So you want to remember that, that that is an antibody kind of attachment site on the actual bacteria. So what I want you to remember is that antibodies attack or attach to the O antigen of the actual lipopolysaccharides. Okay, beautiful. That is the outer membrane. What I want you to know, phospholipobilar has porins, has lipopolysaccharide structure, which is an endotoxin, three components of it. Lipid A, core polysaccharide O antigen. O antigen is a site for antibody attachment when the immune system is activated. Core polysaccharide, nothing particular. Lipid A is the nasty component which has the ability to stimulate macrophages, immune system cells to release massive amounts of cytokines, particularly these three, which can induce a septic vasodilatory process. Okay, and big thing, remember this is only in gram-negative bacteria. Okay, cool, we covered the most outer layer, capsule slime layer. We covered the next one, which is only in gram-negative bacteria, which is the outer membrane. What's the next part? The next one, which is just inside of the outer membrane, is the cell wall. All right, so the next component is the cell wall. So we've, again, we're going from outer to inner. We got that capsule slime layer. We got then the outer membrane, cell wall. Cell wall, one of the big things that I want you guys to know before we go over like what it's made up of, because that's kind of a big topic, is what is the kind of big function of it? Okay, so we're kind of going a little bit backwards. We've been talking about structure, then function, but just real quickly, let's kind of reverse it on this one. What's function? And then we'll talk a little bit more about structure. So function of the cell wall is obviously it gives shape to the bacteria. It helps with kind of the structural integrity of the bacteria. So when I talk about that, it's involved with shape and integrity of bacteria. Okay, kind of resistance against like osmotic kind of changes as well. But one of the things is, that's big with this, and we'll have another video dedicated to kind of like bacterial nomenclature, is it gives bacteria different shapes, <laughs> which is really cool. So for example, you can have a bacteria that's like circular, like cocci, or it's rod shaped like bacillus, or it's kind of a mixture of cocci and bacillus, so it's coxobacillus. You can have one that's kind of like comma shape, which is like your vibrio. And then you have the ones that are kind of like snake or kind of like spirally shaped, we call spirilla. And so we'll have a kind of a, another video, particularly focusing on bacterial nomenclature and things like that. But I think it's one of the cool things about the cell walls that gives that shape, which we have different types of nomenclature for, which is pretty cool. Cool. The other thing that I want you guys to know about the cell wall is that this is present in both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. So it's in both gram positive and negative bacteria. But we'll talk about it in just a second, there is a difference in the cell wall, particularly the thickness of the cell wall when you're comparing it from gram positive to gram negative. We'll talk about it in a little bit. So we know that it's involved in shape, integrity, chain, or resistance against osmotic changes, and it's in both gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria. The next thing that I want you guys to know is actually like the, what is it made up of, like some of the structure component of it. And it's actually made of what's called a peptidoglycan, peptidoglycans. You're like, what the heck would that mean, man? So peptidoglycans, there's two components in that, in the name, peptido, so there's proteins, peptides, and glycans, sugar. So let's focus on the sugar portion, the glycan. There's two components that we actually polymerize and make these glycan backbones. And this one here in pink, we're gonna call, I'm just picking it, there's no particular reason, I'm just, no rhyme or reason, just picking it. The pink one we're gonna call N-acetylmuramic acid, which we call NAM, that's one of the, the actual sugar molecules. And the other one, here in this kind of blue color here is called N-acetylglucosamine, which we're gonna just abbreviate as NAG. What happens is these NAGs and NAMs get polymerized together, and when they do that, they make this glycan or sugar backbone. 
Then what happens is there's a special type of enzyme called a transpeptidase, which is kind of a, a domain on a special type of enzyme we'll talk about later called a penicillin binding protein. And what that protein does is, is it kind of links together these glycan backbones. So this is your peptide chains, which is gonna be linking the glycan backbones together. So that's what I want you to remember, is when we talk about the peptidoglycan layer of the cell wall, it's made up of NAGs and NAMs that are polymerized to make a glycan backbone, and peptide chains that are formed by a very specific enzyme, which is called the transpeptidase, which is a domain on the penicillin binding proteins that cross link them together. Beautiful. One of the big things though, let's briefly talk about here, is kind of like, what is some of another significant point about this peptidoglycan layer? Well, one of the big things I want you guys to remember is that there is another structure that's kind of like similar to the lipopolysaccharides. Remember the LPS is the endotoxin only found in the outer membrane, which is only found in gram-negative bacteria. You know gram-positive bacteria? They have something that's kind of like homologous to that. And so in that, they have a molecule called lipotechoic acid, which we're gonna abbreviate as LT. A, lipotechoic acid is this purple structure that extends from the inner membrane and extends all the way through the cell wall. What is the significance of the lipotechoic acid that extends through the cell wall? You know what it loves to do? It loves to be able to stimulate white blood cells like macrophages and stimulate these macrophages to release particular types of cytokines like interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha, which have the ability to produce fever, hypotension, uh, increase inflammation, vasodilatory effects, and potentially kind of cause a septic process. So that is your lipotechoic acid. Now you're probably like, well, what is this pink thing that doesn't touch the inner membrane, but it's still kind of incorporated within that cell wall or peptidoglycan layer? Glad you asked. This thing here is not connected to the lipid membrane, but it is a kind of like fatty acid structures. We call this a tachoic acid, okay? Tachoic acid. So tachoic acid is a part of this structure that extends just through the cell wall, doesn't touch the inner membrane. Lipotachoic acid touches the inner cell membrane, extends through the cell wall, and involved in stimulating this kind of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha process. Last quick thing here, just because I said that there was a small difference here in peptidoglycan layer, what I want you to remember when it comes to gram-positive versus gram-negative. Gram-positive versus Gram negative with the peptidoglycan layer. Gram positive has a thicker peptidoglycan layer, and gram negative bacteria has a thinner peptidoglycan layer. Please don't forget that. Okay, so we have cell wall, maintains structural integrity, prevents like osmotic kind of changes, and, and, and influences cell shape. Found in both gram-positive, gram-negative bacteria, it's made up of peptidoglycans, which is made up of N-acetylglucosamine, N-acetylmuramic acid, which is sugar molecules that are polymerized to make a uh, glycan backbone, cross-linked through transpeptides, and again, gram-positive has a thicker peptidoglycan layer, gram-negative has a thinner peptidoglycan layer, and again, another significance is that only in, oh, I gotta make sure you guys remember this, only in gram-positive bacteria do they have this lipotechoic acid that is involved in this kind of interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrotic factor alpha process that can cause kind of a septic process. It's kind of analogous to the LPS that was in gram-negative bacteria. So only gram-positive bacteria, let's actually make this look a little bit nicer, gram-positive bacteria has that lipotechoic acid. All right, beautiful, roasted. Let's move on to the next component here, which is the periplasm. All right, so the next part, so again, we've covered capsule, slime layer from outer to the outer membrane, to the cell wall, to the periplasm. Now, the periplasm is the next structure. Now, here's the big thing. The periplasm, how do you define it? It is the space between, I'm gonna abbreviate this, the outer membrane, which is only present in what type of bacteria? Gram-negative bacteria, and the inner membrane which we haven't gotten to yet, but this is present in gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. It's that space between. Now, what was in that space that we talked about? If you guys remember, outer membrane and gram-negative bacteria, and then we hit 
cell wall. So that's our peptidoglycan layer with the NAM, NAG, and transpeptide uh, bonds there. Okay, the peptide bonds via, formed by the transpeptidases. In the periplasmic space, okay, which is the space between the outer membrane and inner membrane, which obviously, which bacteria only have outer membranes? <laughs> Gram negative. So you can only have a periplasmic space in Gram negative bacteria, therefore, by that definition. What is the significance of it? You see this little like dude, little bee dude? This is a very special enzyme. And this enzyme, we talked about a little bit over here before. It's called a beta lactamase. Remember that when we talked about the pilus? Where you can actually like have, have those plasmids that actually have genes that can be transcribed, translated, make proteins like beta lactamase that make things resistant to antibiotics and you can pass that on to other bacteria to make them more resistant. Beta lactamase sits within the periplasmic space. So you know whenever somebody takes like for example, you have a gram negative bacteria and then they take a drug like penicillin. And penicillin has to get through the outer membrane, through the peptidoglycan layer. And what happens is this beta lactamase will come and say, hey, penicillin, I'm going to inhibit you. And then render it ineffective in being able to pre you know, prevent or inhibit the cell wall growth. So that's kind of the cool thing about the beta lactamase. So again, periplasm only technically found in gram negative bacteria since only gram negative bacteria have outer membrane and inner membrane. And the definition is the space between outer and inner membrane. In that space is the beta lactamase, allowing for resistance to antibiotics like penicillin. Boom, roasted, we went to the last component of the cell envelope. What is the most inner component? The inner membrane, baby. Inner membrane, what is it made up of? It is a phospholipid bilayer. Now, within that phospholipid bilayer, there's obviously different types of proteins. So different types of like porins. There's different types of enzymes that are involved in like, you know, oxidative metabolism or different types of DNA replication or other enzymatic metabolic processes. But one of the big proteins that I need you guys to definitely remember is this one right here that's shaped like a P. <laughs> this right here, this bugger, is called the penicillin binding protein. Now the penicillin binding protein, we talked about it a little bit over here and we can actually kind of refer to it while we're here. The penicillin binding protein has kind of like one like domain, like a little like, like imagine like a little arm out here that has what's called a trans peptidase function. And what does that mean? It means you see these bonds here that are formed the peptide bonds that are formed between the glycan backbones, that's actually by that enzyme, which is kind of a domain on the penicillin binding protein, which is found where? On the inner membrane. Inner membrane, is that found on gram-positive bacteria, gram-negative bacteria, or both? Well, all of them have it, right? So both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria have this inner membrane. So they both have penicillin binding proteins. The whole reason this is significant is when you give a drug like penicillin, what does penicillin do? Penicillin's design is to be able to inhibit that transpeptidase portion on the penicillin binding protein. If you inhibit this portion, can you cross link the actual glycan backbones that stabilize the cell wall? No, if you can't stabilize that cell wall, are you gonna be able to grow it? No, you'll start losing the structural integrity. You'll start losing the ability to resist against osmotic fluctuations. And then what happens? The actual bacteria can die. And so that's one of the big things to think about is the significance of this penicillin binding protein. Okay, boom, roasted baby, we done did it. That is the cell envelope. Now, the absolute most important thing to take away from this is you guys are probably gonna get a question on the exam about what are the differences in the cell envelope between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria? Let's quickly, and I mean quickly, review what we have just talked about this entire time. Here's your gram-positive bacteria. Here's your gram-negative bacteria. From outer to inner, they both can have what? a capsule or a slime layer. Then you go to the next thing. Okay, what's the next thing that we hit? We said outer membrane. Outer membrane is only present in gram-negative bacteria, not present here in gram-positive bacteria. What's on the uh, outer membrane that was so significant and important? We said it's a phospholipid bilayer that had porins that allow for things to move in and out, but the big thing was this thing sticking out here called the LPS, the endotoxin called the lipopolysaccharides. You don't see that on gram-positive bacteria, 
but you do see that on gram negative bacteria. Okay, what's the next thing? After the outer membrane, then we had cell wall. Cell wall is the peptidoglycan component, which is made up of NAM, NAGs, which is your glycan backbones, and then your peptide bonds, which are cross-linking them. So here's your uh, peptidoglycan layer here, which is component of the cell wall, and then here in the gram-negative bacteria. What do you notice in the difference of thickness here? Gram-positive, they got a thick peptidoglycan layer, and then in the gram-negative, they got a baby thin peptidoglycan layer. So that's another big significant point here. The other thing here that's important is that in that cell wall, in gram-positive bacteria, they have this structure that extends from the actual inner membrane or from the cell wall. Only in gram-positive bacteria, what is this thing here called? The lipotechoic acid or tachoic acid? Do you see that here in the gram-negative bacteria? No. So there's no lipotechoic acid or tachoic acid present in the gram-negative bacteria. The next thing is, we had a periplasmic space. Do you see a periplasmic space here in gram positive? No, because they don't have an outer membrane. It's the space between outer membrane and inner membrane. Which one has the outer membrane? Gram negative bacteria. So it has to be the space between here. What's in that space? Oh, a little beta lactamase enzyme. And that's only in gram negative bacteria. And then the last thing here is that you have the gram positive bacteria and gram negative bacteria. They both have the inner membrane and they both have the penicillin binding proteins. And remember the last thing I told you guys? They both can have flagella, but which one did I tell you that the pilus is primarily most common in? Gram negative bacteria. And what was this example that we used as gram negative bacteria being able to transmit kind of resistance to antibiotics? The beta lactamase. Which one has beta lactamase? The gram negative bacteria. Does it have it here in gram positive? No. So we now understand, and we have a pretty good understanding of gram-positive versus gram-negative bacteria. Now what we have to do to just cap it all off is talk about the actual protocol procedures that you need to understand to do in the lab about how to do the gram-staining procedure and microscopically visualize what is the difference between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Let's hit that. All right, so now what we have to talk about is the gram-staining procedure. You guys need to know this because when you guys are in the lab, you'll have to know the steps to be able to perform in order, in sequence, why you're doing it in this particular sequence. And then after you know how to do this procedure step-by-step, step, you should be able to identify microscopically which one is gram positive and which one's gram negative bacteria based upon the staining or the color of it. And then which ones kind of fall into this you know, atypical uh, category of bacteria and knowing which one those are. All right, so let's go through this process. You take, you grow your bacteria in whatever culture you've done it. You take that, you scoop it onto a slide. After you've applied the bacteria onto the slide, which is your step one, you're then going to take and heat up the slide. When you heat up the slide, the whole purpose of that is to get the bacteria to fixate to the slide. Okay, so the second step is to heat up the slide to get the bacteria to fixate. Once the bacteria has been fixated to the slide, the third step is you're going to apply what's called a particular type of stain called a crystal violet stain, which obviously gives off a violet purplish type of color. You apply the stain to the slide. What happens is the bacteria that are on the slide should suck up that crystal violet into the peptidoglycan layer, and they should stain purple. Which bacteria have peptidoglycan layers? Both gram-positive and both gram-negative bacteria. So let's imagine for a second, you looked underneath, you looked at the microscope, you pulled it, after you applied the, the crystal violet, you looked under the microscope, and you looked to see what the bacteria looked like. All of them should stain purple because they've taken up that crystal violet color. Why is that? Let me explain this for a second here. If you look here, we have on this side our gram positive, and here we have our gram negative bacteria. You give the crystal violet. Now, the crystal violet is just going to get soaked up into the peptidoglycan layer. Now, the gram positive has a very thick peptidoglycan layer. So it has lots of area that you can have that actual crystal violet soak up into. Okay, also, here's another interesting thing. Gram-negative bacteria have an outer membrane, which makes it a little bit more like selectively permeable. So less crystal violet will be able to get into the peptidoglycan layer because it's going to have to go through that porins. So less of it will get in there. And another additional fact here is that there's less peptidoglycan. So there's less actual like amounts of crystal violet that's going to be within that peptidoglycan layer. But nonetheless, there's peptidoglycan that's saturated within this actual, there's crystal violet, sorry, stain that's saturated within this peptidoglycan layer of both gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Okay. The next step after we've applied the crystal violet is we don't want that crystal violet to kind of like leach out. And so how do we kind of like, 
cement, or keep that crystal violet kind of like fixated and stuck in that area of the peptidoglycan component of the gram positive and gram negative bacteria. We apply a mordant. And this mordant that we're gonna have here, in, uh, this uh, reddish color here, is gonna be called iodine. It's called a mordant. And all that means is, let's say here we have again, our gram positive bacteria, our gram negative bacteria, and we can identify that based upon thick peptidoglycan, thin peptidoglycan, and gram negative only has the outer membrane, gram positive does not, right? We know that the crystal violet in step three here has been saturated in that actual peptidoglycan layer. We know it's also saturated here within that gram negative layer. What the iodine does is it kind of latches onto the crystal violet and keeps it really kind of like locked into that peptidoglycan layer. So it kind of acts like a little bit of a cement to keep some of that crystal violet in the peptidoglycan layer, okay? So that's our fourth step. Now, the fifth step is the interesting step. The fifth step is we apply something called like ethanol or alcohol, some kind of alcohol-based substance, maybe even like acetone sometimes is applied, but it's an ethanol wash, right? And what you do is you take like a bottle of like, you know, some ethanol or acetone and you keep, you know, you squirt that over for a certain period of time over the slide and you're trying to wash some of the crystal violet out of the peptidoglycan layer. Now, the theory behind how this actual like ethanol does this is it may compress the actual peptidoglycan layer and also may have like a little bit of a dissolving effect or put holes within kind of like phospholipid bilayers to allow for some of that crystal violet to be able to leach out. But either way, the whole design of the ethanol is to kind of suck some of the crystal violet or wash some of the crystal violet out of the peptidoglycan layer. Now, come here for a second and realize what do we have so far going back to this point here. Again, here is our gram positive, here's our gram negative bacteria. We have that peptidoglycan layer filled with our crystal violet here and that gram positive. We have it filled here within the gram negative. We have the mordant trying to kind of keep it situated in here, which is the iodine. And then we apply the ethanol. When you apply the ethanol, it is going to pull some of that crystal violet out of the gram positive bacteria. It's gonna pull some of it out, but it shouldn't pull ton, as much out as you, as you actually think. The reason why is why. You have saturated that peptidoglycan layer with tons of crystal violet. There's tons of it. And then you have some of it pretty fixated really well in there with the iodine as the mordant. The gram negative bacteria though, there wasn't really much crystal violet in there to begin with because you had a very thin peptidoglycan layer. So there's not a crystal violet there present in general, like amount. And also there was less of that crystal violet probably be able to get in to the actual peptidoglycan layer because of the outer membrane. So when you apply ethanol to the gram negative bacteria, it's gonna wash out the very little amounts of crystal violet that you do have. You're gonna have lots of crystal violet in gram positive, not as much in gram negative. So when you apply that ethanol wash, it is gonna suck out tons and tons of that crystal violet that you had there. And so effectively, what should happen is if you took at that, that moment, looked at the slide after you applied the ethanol wash, what should happen? The bacteria that were gram positive should still be retaining that crystal violet, unless you freaking applied so much ethanol that you literally washed all of it out. So sometimes if you do apply too much ethanol for a too long period of time, you can leach out enough crystal violet out of the gram positive bacteria and it won't stain purple. So that's why you have to do it for, you know, you don't do it very long. But once you uh, have that ethanol wash and you look under the microscope, the gram positive bacteria should still be retaining some of that crystal violet. So what color should they be under the microscope? Purple. The gram negative bacteria, in theory, if you apply the ethanol wash and yank some of that crystal violet out, the very little crystal violet that you had there, there shouldn't really be any purple color there. So they shouldn't have any purple color. They shouldn't stain purple. And that will be your gram negative bacteria. But we still can't identify them because they're not staining a particular color that makes them obvious on the slide. So how can we make it obvious that, that the ones that aren't actually staining, that there is some gram negative bacteria on that slide. How do I identify them? Because I don't have a color that makes them pop or stand out. Well, that's where the next thing comes in. The next thing is we apply what's called a counter stain. 
The counter stain is we use something which is this purple structure here. We apply what's called the counter stain. We apply this molecule called safranin. What safranin does is, is it should soak into the peptidoglycan layer that doesn't have any crystal violet. So wherever there's no crystal violet, that safranin should soak into that peptidoglycan layer. Well, let's think here. Here's our gram-positive bacteria. Here's our gram-negative bacteria. We said that some of the crystal violet may get washed from the gram-positive bacteria, but there should be still a decent amount that's actually retained there, keeping it purple. You washed out the crystal violet whenever you did the ethanol wash from the gram-negative bacteria, but if you give that safranin, that should soak up into the peptidoglycan layer that does not have any crystal violet, and it should do what? Give the color of that stain when you look at it under the microscope. So if I look at it under the microscope, now, the gram-negative bacteria that didn't, weren't staining previously should stain pink. Why? Because they soaked up that safranin. And that will tell me what type of bacteria I have. So at the end of it, after you've applied your counter stain or your safranin, you look under the microscope, the bacteria that stain pink mean that they retained the actual counter stain or the safranin has to be the gram-negative bacteria. And then the ones that retain the actual crystal vial throughout the entire time is the gram-positive bacteria. I hope that makes sense. Okay, the last thing is that sometimes there's bacteria that don't really stain like an obvious color. And so we kind of fit them into this weird, like they're kind of considered gram-negative bacteria, but they don't really stain. And so we actually call them atypical bacteria. And all I want you to know is the names of these atypical bacteria, and that's it. All right, so again, what I really want you to remember is that these atypical bacteria are technically clumped within the category of gram-negative bacteria because they don't stain a particular grit, like crystal violet color. They don't really stain in general. But these atypical bacteria, you should actually remember them because, again, they're not really going to have that classic gram-positive, gram-negative stain. And so there's a mnemonic that helps us to be able to remember Remember this. It's these atypical microbes usually lack color because microbes barely eat ramen. <laughs> okay, it's a random one, but it, it, it may help you to remember it. So the T in these stands for tryponema. So tryponema politum, right, which is the bacteria that causes syphilis. The A for atypical stands for anaplasmosis. The M in microbes can be mycoplasma. The U in usually is for urea plasma. And let's move on over here to these. The L in lac is for leptospira. And it can actually be a double. You can actually consider it legionella. The C in color would be for chlamydia. The B and because can be for Bartonella. The M in microbes, is there, so there's another M. This was mycoplasma. This is mycobacteria. The B in barely, there's another B. This was for Bartonella, the because. The barely can be Borrelia, like the Borrelia burgdorferi and Lyme's disease. The E for eat is Ehrlichia like ehrlichiosis from the tick bite, and R is for ramen, <laughs> which is rickettsia, which again is another kind of a species of ticks, okay? B bacteria from ticks. So again, this would cover your atypical bacteria. Again, quick reminder of these, these are technically within that gram-negative category. They don't really fit in that actual staining process of purple or crystal violet, I'm sorry, crystal violet or that pink kind of saffron in color. And again, it's tryponema, anaplasmosis, mycoplasma, ureaplasma, leptospira or legionella, chlamydia, bartonella, mycobacteria, Borrelia, Ehrlichia, and rickettsia. That covers our discussion on the structure and function of bacteria. All right, engineers, in this video, we talk about the structure and function of bacteria as well as the gram staining procedure. I hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope you learned a lot. As always, engineers, until next time.